series, we have got our second part of our paediatric trauma talk today and we've got two exceptional speakers joining us. We've got Miss Anna Bridgens and Miss Anushka Ayub today. Miss Anna Bridges is a consultant paediatric orthopedic trauma surgeon at St George's University Hospital and she'll be talking to us about common paediatric fractures as well as Salter Harris and we also have Miss Anushka Ayub who is a post-CCT clinical fellow currently at the Royal London Hospital specialising in paediatric orthopedics and Miss Ayub will be talking to us about the limping child, sorry, <laughs> will be talking to us about the limping child. And uh, just a few housekeeping rules, please do make sure that you are muted and please avoid annotating the slides. And uh, I'm Shamli Chandrakuma and I'll be your host today. So if you have any questions, please do pop them in the chat and I will ask our speakers at the very end. And um, first of all, I will introduce Miss Anna Bridgens. Thank you very much. If you can now show your screen, <laughs> Miss Bridgens, thank you. Okay. Right. Hi there, everyone. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm Anna Bridgens. I'm a paediatric orthopedic consultant at St. George's. And um, I was asked to talk today um, for approximately half an hour on Harris fractures. So um, it's quite a broad topic and quite a specific topic. So I'm going to just talk about fractures around the physis for a little bit and complications associated with those, and then just um, focus a little bit on children's fractures in general. And then, um, and then throughout, we will do some case studies, and um, I've thrown in a few multiple choice questions to um, make it a little bit more interactive, as interactive as it can be in this format. Okay, so. Just to get us started, um, I, hope, I don't know if you can see all of that because half of my screen is covered by a strip, but um, there is an apian lateral of a tibia here, of an immature skeleton, and um, what I would like you to do is just select, this is the first MCQ, um, select option one to four with the correct annotations, um, please just to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're talking about the same things. And I can gauge where you're at. I'm hoping the answers will pop up in a minute. We'll just give it another 10 seconds. <laughs> I know it's quite a, quite a few words to read there. <laughs> Have you not had many responses? <laughs> I've shared the results now. Where where have you shared it? Because I oh. can't see it. It should. Why not? Uh, <laughs> I can tell you what people voted. So yeah. um, uh, the commonest answer was uh, actually it was between options one and two. Really? Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, I'm I'm just wondering whether I've done that wrong. But no, um, I, don't, I don't think it was. By the way, the commonest answer was four. That's seventy percent. Okay. Perfect. All right. Why can't I see this? I don't know why I can't see this, but never mind. Um, so yes, that's the right answer. Number four is the right answer. So, um, you've got A as the diaphysis. B and um, B is an is the epiphysis, C the metaphysis, and D is the physis, and also E is the physis of the fibula as well. Okay, so um, if we um, just recap this with a um, 
coronal section through a proximal tibia, you can see you have the epiphysis here, then the growth plate and the metaphysis and the diaphysis, um, which uh, comes into the, the main shaft of the tibia. Um, so we're focusing today on the talk uh, around fractures around that growth plate, which lies between the epiphysis and the metaphysis. And the orientation of that obviously depends on which um, end of the bone we're looking at. So the growth plate is made up of lots of chondrocytes, which are held in an extracellular matrix. And that extracellular matrix is what gives the physis, the growth plate, its strength. And the growth plate is split into four main layers. If you start from the epiphysis working downwards, you have the germinal or the resting zone, and then the prol proliferative zone. And that area has got a lot of extracellular matrix. So that means that it's very strong and can resist lots of shear forces. But then you come down into the hypertrophic zone and there is less extracellular matrix. And this is more susceptible to shear forces and therefore fractures. And then the last layer is where the chondrocytes ossify and you have endochondral ossification, okay? And that's at the metaphyseal side of the growth plate. So I hope that is clear. Um, now, sorry, let me just try and... Approximately 20% of children's fractures occur at the growth plate. And because of this, um, because they're quite common, uh, they, uh, I, I suppose, they've been very, uh, they were classified by these two surgeons in, um, one was in, from Canada, one from America, Bob Salter and William Harris. Um, Salter, Bob Salter was uh, really, eminent pediatric surgeon who's also um, put his name to the Salter osteotomy of uh, pelvic uh, uh, osteotomies for hip dysplasia and William Harris is from the Harris Hip School. Um, so quite eminent uh, surgeons. They in 1963 um, put together the Salter Harris classification for physeal fractures and the the this classification is actually quite a useful classification because it gives you information on prognosis and it also gives you information on how we should be managing these fractures, okay? So um, I found a, it's, it's a relatively useful monomic for um, these fractures, it's American, um, but essentially um, the classification is from one to five and um, the S, is for straight through the physis. A is going through the physis and up into the metaphysis, so away from the joint. And L is through the um, through the physis and into the epiphysis. And they, um, that means uh, the L is for, I suppose, low on the lower side. And then T is through the metaphysis and the epiphysis. And then this is the American part of it, so the crush. Um, crush uh, injury to the physis. So ER stands for total erasure of the physis. Um, okay, so let's another MCQ for you guys. So A to E, which Salter Harris fracture has the best prognosis um, uh, looking at those fractures up, uh, up there? Um, I still can't see. I, I don't know. Um, will you tell me when the... Uh, we'll let you know when the answers right. are ready. That's Thanks, ready. guys. Can you see them now? No. <laughs> uh, at the bottom of your screen, there might be something called... Po uh, if you click on polling, it might pop up. But the commonest answer was uh, Salter Harris won at 64% of the votes. Um, okay, I so I think this is a contentious issue. I um, Because I it's tied between Salter Harris one and Salter Harris two. Um, and I, I, I from, I think Salter Harris two actually has a slightly better outcome than a Salter Harris one. 
because some of the Salter Harris worn fractures can be quite significant injuries, um, whereby you have, um, particularly at birth, you can have a um, total transficeal injury of the elbow or the proximal humerus, and these can get missed. Whereas Salter Harris twos are actually easier to pick up, and they actually account for about seventy five percent of um, all uh, physeal injuries. So, but one and two definitely have the better outcome, and they occur in younger children. And then, as you go towards the three and fours, these are intraarticular fractures for a start. So you have to make sure that these fractures are reduced and. Um, uh, so that you have a congruent joint because that can lead to arthritis um, later later on in life. Um, and then obviously then the fives, which is a crush injury to the physis, which can actually be missed um, sometimes because you can't actually pick those up on uh, x-ray. Those can have really significant um, out, poor outcomes. The prognosis also depends on what bone is involved. Um, if um, Sorry, if um, the distal radius, for example, has a much better outcome from injury than the distal femur. So the distal, it, if you in, if you have a Salter Harris two of the distal radius, that that could, that really has a very good result. Whereas Salter Harris two of the distal radius is much more likely to lead to a growth arrest, for example. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so this is an APN left. Uh, knee, a 14-year-old boy who hit, um, who was on his electric scooter and um, came off. It's a closed, isolated injury. Um, what type of Salter Harris fracture is this? So the commonest answer was um, Salter Harris too. Yes, excellent, well done guys. Okay, so um, now in a Salter Harris two, a portion of the metaphysis remains with the epiphysis. What is my arrow pointing to? Um, MCQ4 here. Thurston Holland fragment, Wagstaffler four, avulsion, Sagon fracture, Tilo fracture, Pellegrini steeda lesion. Commonest answer was Thurston Holland fragment. Yeah, excellent. What was the percentage? 55%. Uh, okay, great. So yeah, very good. So this is the Thurston Holland fragment and um, it can be useful actually if it's a significant size to um, for fixation, which I'll come on to now. So um, this, so if we're thinking about how we're going to manage this fracture, the things that we we need to think about are, can we, first of all, can we leave it in this position or do we need to reduce it? So if this was a distal radius in a younger child, potentially we don't need to, um, or that's what we're, that's what some of the evidence would point to. But this, we know that distal femur femur fractures have there'll be an angular deformity here if we left it and very high chance of going on to a growth arrest. So we need to reduce it. And then we need to think about um, the age of the patient and whether we need to do a physeal sparing type surgery or whether we can cross the physis with our fixation. So he's 14. What we did in this case is we got a CT scan, um, which I haven't got a picture of now, but we, um, assess the size of that Thurston Holland, that metaphyseal spike, to see if we may be able to do a fixation with cannulated screws if it was large enough um, and um, hold the fracture um, in place. And that is exactly what we did do, but um, we were unable to completely reduce it and we had to do a small medial open uh, in small medial incision to clear out the periosteum from the medial side to make sure that we uh, had no blotch reduction. 
If the child was slightly smaller, we could do cross K wires, smooth, smooth K wires um, and put him in a plaster. And also the other option would be um, potentially a plate on the medial side, which could buttress the, um, the I suppose, so it would form an axilla to buttress this part of the medial um, condyle. Um, they, that could be a physeal sparing, but um, I'll, uh, he's 14 and actually if, if he had had a plate put on that, um, well, we'll come on to how much growth we think he has left in a, in a bit, but it, it, it really in his age group, we would want to try and um, avoid crossing the physis with a plate, okay? So that's what we did. So they, those were um, partially threaded, cancellous uh, cannulated screws, okay, that went through. So we would have put guide wires in first and then put the screws over the top. So I've got another case for you here. Um, so this is a 12 year old boy who had a fall from a bike um, and it's a closed injury. So just have a look at this, um, these radiographs. Um, and then I'm going to ask you on the next slide, uh, multiple choice question, one uh, A to E of the best management option for this uh, fracture, okay? So I'm gonna go onto it now, there you go. So you've got A, plaster cast for six weeks, B, manipulation in theatre and application of cast, C, application of exfix, D, manipulation in theatre with an open reduction to ensure there's no periosteum in the fracture and apply a cast, or E, skin traction. So if you could put that on as a poll. We'll just give it another few seconds. Uh, so the commonest answer with 50% of the votes was manipulation in theatre and application of plaster cast. Okay, so I, maybe this question wasn't great, but I think that um, you really, if you did that reduction and you were really happy with your reduction that there was no gap um, at the front here, can you see my arrow um, where I'm pointing? Yes. Yeah, you need to be really, really clear that there's no gap at the front. And I would always have a really low threshold to go with D to just do a small incision to clear the periosteum out um, to make sure that you get a perfect reduction at the front. Um, there was um, a study in the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics which showed that any residual gap of more than three millimeters, um, approximately 60% of these fractures go on to have a growth rest. So just need to be, um, really, um, I suppose maybe I'm really, really careful that there is no gap there and no periosteum in that fracture side. So I just put that in for, for that kind of that learning point there, okay? So this boy, he's 12, he comes back to see you in clinic um, six months later. And the obvious abnormalities with this fracture are that he's got a synostosis, so a join between his fibula and his tibia, which I'm not particularly worried about. But what I am more worried about is that he has got, um, he, I can't see his physis anymore, um, his distal tibial physis. Um, a, potentially I can see a small part of it on the lateral side, but I can't, and it's the same on the lateral as well, all right? So what investigation would you guys do at this point, um, seeing him in clinic? A CT, an MRI, a CT and an MRI, an ultrasound scan or blood test to exclude an infection? Cole, please. The commonest answer was MRI with 47%. Okay, so I think that's completely reasonable um, to do an MRI. Um, and a lot of people would just do an MRI or a lot of people would just do a CT. I think there's benefit in both of these at this point in time because a CT would show that whether there is um, a 
what we call a physeal bar, so a bony bar that is joining, and perhaps an MRI would show it as well, but you would get, I, I think you get a bit more information with a CT where the bar is joining from the tibia, from the metaphysis to the epiphysis. And an MRI would also give you more information of how much generally of the physis is involved in terms of um, closure. And radiologists do think that that is slightly more sensitive, but I quite, I would like to get information from both uh, modalities. Um, and so we got that, we got those imaging images and the, um, it's essentially shown that there is um, complete destruction of the physis, of the distal tibial physis, um, much more than 50%. If there's a bony bar of less than 30, between 30, less than 30%, you may go ahead and try and resect it, so take it away. And that's slightly easier if that bony bar is um, on the outside of the bone and not centrally, okay? So we know that he's got a complete physeal arrest and he is 12 years old. So the things that we need to think about are his age, how much growth he's got left, um, and is there complete disruption or partial disruption of the physis? So I've just said that there's uh, complete so will this lead to a leg length discrepancy? Yes, likely, because he's only 12. Will this lead to an angular deformity? So an angular deformity is a deformity in the coronal plane, so looking front on, or the sagittal plane, so looking from the side. So you would only tend to get an angular deformity if, um, if there was a bony bar and the or the uh, medial or side of the tibia that would lead to that. So I'm not expecting an angular deformity and clinically he doesn't look like he has one. And then if there was a physeal bar, you'd want to know the size and location and whether it was amenable to resection. So uh, an operation to take it out and then you tend to replace it with fat. Um, and um, you also need to think about the physis that is affected because um, the distal femur, as I've said, is much more susceptible to growth arrests and then distal tibia then proximal tibia then distal radius so so it's it's a slightly um it's a it's a worrying situation so the treatment options at this point are to observe him to complete a partial arrest um this is if there is a growth arrest you can complete the partial arrest by doing what's called an epipsiodesis when you drill out the uh, growth plate so you destroy it completely so that the bit is, that is able to still grow can't so that prevents getting those angular deformities you can take the, the bar the abnormal connection between the metaphysis and the epiphysis out um, or you can correct the angular deformity or the leg bent difference okay so those are your options and so what are we going to do with this boy so um make a decision of what we're going to really do. We need to know the answer to the following questions. So we need to know what age this tibia is gonna carry on growing for. Um, well, not this tibia, but the other side. So how short is this leg going to be? And how much does the distal tibia grow a year? So we know he's 12. And so how many more years of growth um, has he got left? So the, these are the next two questions that I was just going to ask you. So firstly, what age do long bones roughly stop growing in boys? And how much does the distal tibia grow a year? Um, so that's MCQ seven and eight. So we have the answers for MCQ seven and at 55%, 16 was the commonest. Great, spot on guys. I'd say between 15 to 17, so 16 is great, yeah. So we know he's got four more years of growth left and how much does the distal tibia grow a year? Just give that a few seconds and we'll get an answer soon. And the commonest answer with 42% of the votes was three. Perfect, yes. So the distal tibia goes three millimeters, the proximal tibia six and the femur nine. So we can, he's got about um, one, 1. 1.2 centimeters left of growth. 
And I think based on that information, we can observe this boy because he can manage that with a shoe raise and it, it would be much more disastrous, I suppose, if it was his distal femur, but, but the, going forward, I, I think that we can, I have decided to manage this boy without an operation at present. So that's just an example of some complications that can occur, okay? So just, um, Next question. Oh gosh. Oh no, I've given the answer away. Have I? Um, so quick poll, what what type of Salter Harris fracture is this? The lateral is normal. The lateral x-ray is normal, I should say. Can't see anything on the lateral. Go at five more seconds. The commonest answer was three. Yes. 51% of the votes. How many? 51% of the votes were for okay. three. Perfect. So yeah, this is a Salter Harris three fracture, and this is actually called a telo fracture. And this is an intraarticular fracture of the epiphysis. And it's really in these cases, I actually think it's really important to get a CT scan because any displacement of more than two millimeters really needs to have an operation because um, this can lead to degenerative changes in the ankle going forward. Now, what age group do these fractures normally occur in? Do you know? Um, A, neonates, B, adolescents, C, toddlers, D, preschoolers, or E, all of the above? And the commonest answer with 49% of the votes is adolescence. Yeah, exactly. So this is this is what we call a transitional fracture. And <laughs> it's a specific type of physeal fracture that occurs in um, adolescence when the growth plate is starting to close. So the growth plate um, of the distal tibia starts to close centrally and then goes medially and then progresses to the lateral side and finally the anterolateral part closes. And this, if you come back to this slide, is this portion here where the anterior inferior tibia fibula ligament inserts. Um, so you get this, um, what's called a telo fracture, um, where this pulls off. And we would, um, if it is displaced, we would treat it with a um, partially threaded uh, cannulated screw, either across the epiphysis or if their physis is, is going to close soon um, and you can't get good fixation, you could go into the metaphysis as well. So yeah, a transitional type fracture. And younger children with wider open growth plates just don't have this type of fracture. Another type of um, transitional fracture is what's called a triplane fracture. Um, this is a Salter Harris four type fracture and they can be um, two or three or four part fractures. Um, and they tend to look like a Salter Harris three on the AP. And then depending on whether there are two or a three part, they either look like a Salter Harris two on the lateral or a Salter Harris four. Um, and they, you definitely need a CT to understand the fracture configuration of these. And they are um, essentially three dimensional type fractures. Um, and they tend to recur slightly younger age group compared with the telo fractures, 12 to 15 year olds. But it's just something to be aware of, okay? Um, so um, this is a six year old girl who has come to a fracture clinic and she had a manipulation of a Salter Harris II fracture in A&E um, two weeks ago. And she's come back and her back slab is all loose. And this is, um, what her uh, x-ray now looks like. Who would, who would re-manipulate it? A for yes or B for no? Oh, <laughs> we've got 49% um, yes and 51% no. Okay, so I, I think this is a really difficult thing to get your head around, but I, we should not re-manipulate this. There's, there's two reasons why we shouldn't, okay? It's because 
um, we can do a lot more damage to the physis. This has started to heal. There will be callus there. And to re-manipulate it will require a lot of force, which will cause um, a lot more damage to this growth plate than was initially done. And this child is six years old, and you will be amazed by the remodeling potential of this distal radius, okay? So um, there is a study at the moment um, in the UK called um, CRAFT, which stands for Children's Radius Acute Fracture Fixation Trial. And their study question is that when children up to 10 years old break their wrists, do they need surgery to reset the bones? or will nature correct it itself without, um, without having to have surgery? Um, so this, this is a trial that started in, um, well, started last year, and we're try they're trying to recruit as many children under up to the age of 11 as they can to demonstrate the remodeling potential of distal radius fractures so that we try and reduce the amount of surgery that we're doing. And in their, um, I suppose on their website, there is this um, ama uh, amazing x-ray for you to have a look at to show the Salter Harris 2. And um, I actually can't see the last x-ray, it's, it's behind some pictures, but how it has remodeled over a period of six months or so. Um, so you can see that perhaps we are over treating these fractures operatively of the of the distal radius. Um, uh, so we're hoping to get some uh, result, good results from this trial. Um, so kids fractures, what can we accept? Depend and what we can accept is obviously going to depend on the age of the child. So the younger the child, the more potential for remodeling. Where this, you can accept more deformity um, because there's more potential for correction. If there's an intra-articular fracture, we, we have to ensure that the joint line is uh, well is reduced and congruent so that we don't get degenerative changes later on. Um, the direction of displacement. So if the fracture tends to be in the plane, so if you have a fracture that is angulated um, uh, dorsi, for example, in the plane of movement, that's got a lot more potential to remodel than a uh, fracture which is rotated. You're going to be uh, high energy fractures may have more of a um, risk of non-union because of periosteal stripping. You're going to operate on open fractures anyway. And if they're polytrauma patients, they have associated injuries, you may be more likely to definitively fix a fracture so that they can mobilize quicker. So there's different things to consider. Um, I just put this in to just show you this was a four-year-old boy who fell out of a window who had with autism and he was placed in this hip spiker with actually um, quite significant shortening and no, no opposition of the um, fracture ends. And within six, this was only six weeks later, you can see that there's an excellent callus. It's significant, it is significantly shorter, but this will remodel and you do get overgrowth of the femur um, following a fracture so he, he he will not have any residual shortening from this injury um, and it's quite surprising how how well the bone can remodel um, so just lastly i just wanted to briefly touch on elbow anatomy because when um i, I think this is just really important to be aware of when you get referrals from a and e with swollen elbows and you, you can't see anything on them when when a child when you have a, a baby or a toddler, um, you won't. There will be n the the majority. All of the elbow uh, epiphysis is cartilaginous, and it's not until they um, start growing until they hit two does the first um, ossification center um, appear, which is the capitellum. I've put this little um, kind of prompt up, and you may have heard of it, called Crittal, and it's basically the order of the um, ossification, set, the secondary ossification centers, so the bony bits that appear within the cartilage lumps around the elbow, the cartilage analogs they're called, around the elbow, and it's the capitellum, then the radial head, then the medial stroke internal epicondyle, then the trochlea, then the olecranon and then the lateral condyle. And they appear, it's a rough guide, but two years, four years, six, 
8, 10, 12. And so, you know, um, that will give you an idea of um, what, what uh, is normal and what's abnormal around the elbow x-ray. And you can also use your anterior humeral line and your radio capitella line, which should intercept the capitellum and the anterior humeral line should be in the, the junction of the anterior and middle third of the capitellum. Okay, so I've just got a really um, brief x-ray to show you here, which, um, you know, at first glance, you may, you may think, oh, is there something going on with the uh, proximal ulna, but not really sure, but you draw the anterior humeral line, that's intersecting where it should do, but then the radio capitella line is not going through the capitellum. So you can see the radial head is dislocated. And then I can say to you, how old do you think this child is? And you can see the capitellum has appeared, but the radius hasn't. So it, you know that the child is around three, maybe about to turn four. And what we did with this child is, um, so it's a Montegio type fracture, and we have um, corrected the proximal ulna. And by correcting the proximal ulna, the radius has come back into joint and you can line that up really nicely with the capitellum and what this we also did an arthrogram and what this shows you is you can see the cap the ossification center of the capitellum there but can you see this large lump of cartilage that it's lying between and similarly the large um radial head which you can't see on the x-ray if you go back there's nothing there but here is the cartilage, which the, the, an arthrogram is when you inject dye into the joint and it's uh, radio opaque and therefore you can help uh, outline the cartilage structures within the joint. Okay, so I just wanted to, and then you can see the outline of the distal humerus there. Um, and finally, last image. Um, so this is capitellum radius. Um, here, but then you can't see anything on the internal straight medial epicondyle. So you know this child is about four or five, but there's a fragment here on the lateral side. So you know that this doesn't appear till the child's 12. So this is a lateral condyle fracture, um, which needs to be fixed um, as it's displaced. And actually, sorry, that wasn't the last uh, x-ray. I forgot I put this in. So this child's elbow went onto a lateral condyle non-union um, and was referred to me from uh, the local hospital. And she's unfortunately now gone into a um, cubitus valgus deformity. Uh, so she's got a growth arrest on the lateral side and the medial side is continuing to grow. So she needs to have an operation to try and get that to heal because what will happen is she can get an ulnar nerve palsy as this side continues to grow. I just, so essentially, um, in summary, paediatric bone is very, very forgiving, but you can get caught out very easily. So just don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, and uh, yeah, just, uh, I, I suppose, um, be wary of, of the elbow. I would, that, that's my top tip for uh, paediatric fractures. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry if I've gone over. No, no, thank you very much, Miss Bridgens, and I'm sorry about the technical issues earlier. I knew, I knew there would be, that always was with me, so. No, thank you very much for a brilliant talk, thank you. Um, and now it's with great pleasure that we ask uh, Miss Anushka Ayub to talk about the limping child. I'll just get... Hi there, I'm just trying to get my presentation up. Hang on one second, quick sec, quick sec. Uh, hang on. Oh, we're all up. Hang on. There we go. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Thank can you. you. See me? No, you can't. Can can't you? Can't see you yet. No. Can't see me. How do I put me? Hang on. Start video. Here we go. 
Okay, now you can see me. Oh, I preferred the picture of me in the suit. Never mind, it's a bit cash. Okay, so what we're going to talk about now is the limping child. This is a massive topic, actually. So we need to strip it right down to kind of the most pertinent learning objectives, um, which are going to be to understand how to assess a child of any age with a limp, to be able to make a diagnosis for that child and to be able to present your diagnosis like the absolute trauma god that you guys are, because really that's what we're going for here, to make you better at your job. So the first thing is assessment. So first part of assessment is the history. So you need to ascertain the child's age, birth and developmental history, underlying conditions are very, very important in this. You know, if you've got a child with cerebral palsy or known DDH, you need to know about that. Um, the history of the pain. So how long have the, has the child been on pain? How did it start? Quite often with these, there is kind of a spurious uh, history of trauma. So the parents will see that the child is limping and link it to the other day when they fell down the stairs or tripped here or did this or did that. So, but don't let that catch you out. That's quite often a red herring. Um, hang on a sec, let me just change that. Um, or did they just wake up with it one day and stop moving their leg and stop weight bearing? So the history of pain is very important. Uh, and but also very important is whether there was any preceding illness. So did they have a chorizal illness typically two weeks before? An osteomyelitis you could have had uh, you could have a child with an illness quite a long time in the past. So any illness really in the previous two or three months is relevant and not just in the child, but in the child's family. So other kids uh, in the household. And are there any systemic symptoms? And systemic symptoms means, yes, temperature, but also bad things like weight loss, loss of appetite, uh, change in bowel habit, no more wet nappies or loss of uh, less urine, uh, things like that. So think of those things as well. So those are all very important. The red flags, the things that you absolutely cannot miss. So duration of over five days makes you worried. Severe localized joint pain makes you worried. Complete inability to weight bear, worry. And pain at night, you want to worry about that as well. That pain at night, we spe specifically link to tumors. So think about whether they have pain at night and it gets better during the day and systemic symptoms, any systemic symptoms, including a temperature and all the ones that I mentioned, you're a little bit worried about, okay? So examination, it's very important in all of pediatrics to do as much of your examination without going anywhere near the child, without touching the child, without moving the child, because quite often, as soon as you do, that's basically the end because they get very upset. And obviously a child in pain is going to be even more upset than a child not in pain in the clinic. So observe them at rest, that's very important. The position, the attitude of the limb is very important because we know that for hips particularly, the position of comfort, so the position with least stretch on the capsule is flexion, abduction, and external rotation. And if you observe a child lying with, their, uh, with the posture of the lower limb in that position, that's worrying. For knees, kids will lie with their knee a little bit flexed. They won't want to straighten it. For ankles as well, in uh, plantar flexion, not dorsiflexion. So these things are important, just observing the child at rest. Observe the child walking, ask them to get up and walk around the room with their parents or ask them to move to a different bed if you need to trick them into walking somewhere, things like that with their parents with you nowhere nearby. So you will you might observe limping, you might observe that they're very reluctant to put their foot down, things like that. Observe for rashes, erythema and swelling, and then you can feel things, then palpate for tenderness everywhere. So spine, abdomen because appendicitis, uh, mesenteric adenitis can present and look like hip pain. Uh, examine the pelvis, so you want to examine the bony prominences just in case it's an older child, and they've got an avulsion uh, or from their asis and things like that. Um, examine the hips, examine the knees, examine the ankles, obvious. So assess the range of movement of the spine, quick, ask them to bend down, touch their toes, do a lateral bend, do a lateral bend the other way, look up, look down, all of that stuff. Um, I don't know why I put assess the range of movement of the abdo. That's obviously not, <laughs> not correct, uh, or pelvis, but hips, knees, and ankles. 
So assess the range of movement of everything. So investigations, we want as a baseline, full blood count, CRP, ESR, and you probably will almost always want an X-ray to rule out bony abnormality. If orthopedics is involved, if it's got to us, just do an X-ray to ensure there is no bony abnormality. And in very little kids, orthopedics for kids is like veterinary medicine. So you have to x-ray the whole thing. If, you, if a child is limping, you can't get anywhere near them. It's very difficult to work out what's going on. X-ray hip to ankle to check that everything is okay. Um, it's worth doing because you can be surprised sometimes. And even if you think it's the hip, sometimes you could be surprised with the x-ray. Sometimes it's a missed DDH. Sometimes you can uh, uncover tumors, all those sorts of things. So hip congenital abnormalities, um, lots of things have turned up. The rest of your investigation depends upon your differential diagnosis. So let's get into that. There's loads and loads of algorithms around if you search on the internet for uh, how to piece up your differential diagnosis for hips, but we're gonna keep it super simple. So zero to three years old, four to 10 years old, and 11 to 16 years old. And we're going to just half this up into well kids and sick kids, and that's it, okay? So in the zero to three age group, if your child is well, and that means no temperature, not systemically unwell, you're thinking transient synovitis. In the four to 10 year olds in a well kid, again, you're thinking transient synovitis, but then you add in the possibility of Perthes disease, and we'll talk about that in a sec. In well kids who are a little bit older, uh, 11 to 16, we're thinking about Sufis, and we'll talk about that in a sec as well. In sick kids, zero to three, you're thinking about septic arthritis, and you're thinking about osteomyelitis. Obviously, it could be something less dramatic, but those are the things we're worried about. And guess what? It's the same in the four to 10, and it's the same 11 to 16. So sick kids, hip pain, knee pain, ankle pain, worry about septic arthritis and osteomyelitis across the board. Okay, so since the well kids is a little bit less spicy, we'll go for them first. So well kids, zero to three. Transient synovitis. Usually there is a history of pain. Oh, there's my poll. A history of pain or less than five days. There's a history of preceding illness and only one or less or none of Cocker's criteria and a CRP of less than 20. So what the first question is, is what is Cocker's criteria? So we're gonna talk about this is, this kind of whole thing hinges on Cocker's criteria a little bit. So we need to know what it is. So A, B, or C, non-weight bearing, well, you can read it yourself. Which one of these, A, B, or C, is Cocker's criteria? And yes, Cocker's criteria is pretty old. It's from a paper from 1999, but it has been validated, it has been revalidated since then. So it was revalidated in 2000, and I've written it down because I always forget the dates. Hang on a sec while you're answering that. I wrote it down because I have a terrible memory. So it was revalidated by Cocker in 2004. And then uh, Michelle Caird came along in 2006 and did a study again uh, in, a similar, in a similar vein on what could predict septic arthritis and osteomyelitis and found that a temperature was the most sensitive uh, predictor, but CRP was also a really strong independent factor. And that's where the CRP of 20 cutoff comes from. So you guys, have gone for non-weight bearing, ESR of over 40, fever of 38.5, and white blood cells of 12,000 or over in 59%. And that is correct. But 25% of you did the first, the, the first answer, so A, with the CRP. So a lot of you are using CRP, and we're well, actually we're all using CRP now as a indicator, a strong indicator of whether to be worried or not, but actually it's Michelle Caird's criteria and not Cocker's criteria. So it's not part of Cocker's criteria. A lot of A&Es now don't like to do an ESR, so it's very difficult to do Cocker's criteria. You have to substitute CRP for ESR, which is fine because we're talking about the whole clinical picture, but Cocker's criteria specifically B. So 
here it is non-weight bearing ESR of over 40, fever of over 38.5, and white blood cells of over 12,000. Now, the significance of this is that if you have one, only one of those is 3%. That's why you could say um, if you have only one or less, it's a very low chance of it being a septic arthritis. If you have even two of these, so even if you have non-weight bearing and one fever, that it shoots back up, it shoots up to 40%, and you can't ignore that. So we're saying transient synovitis, if you have a history of pain of less than five days, a history of preceding illness, that's optional because sometimes, you know, kids are snotty nose little things and quite often they're unwell and it goes almost unnoticed after a while um, or after you have a certain number of kids maybe. Um, and 3% risk is all we're accepting. So well kids, four to 10. So we've done transit synovitis. Now we're talking about Perthes disease. So Perthes disease is a uh, avascular necrosis in patches of the epiphysis, which Anna went through, which bit is the epiphysis uh, of the hip. It can, it's often a longer history of limp and it's often what we call a painless limp, which is a bit weird. So it's a limping around child that jumps on and off of the bed, can happily run around the clinic, but is has got a bit of a hobble going on that also goes with a almost pain, um, quite often painless loss of abduction compared to the other side and loss of internal rotation. You have to be very keen with your examination to pick up an early perthes. Um, and on the x-ray, there will often be changes. Sometimes it will look really obvious like this. So you see here fairly normal hip squished epiphysis with a bit of sclerosis here, Perthes disease that you won't really miss on the x-ray. And sometimes it looks a little bit more subtle or even more subtle than this. Sometimes there's just a little tiny bit of change in the epiphysis. Sometimes the epiphysis is round, but just a tiny bit flat and looks a bit funny. But as long as you are aware of this diagnosis, you usually will not miss it. You'll think about it, which is the whole point here. So well kids 11 to 16. So we're talking about Sufis, slipped upper femoral epiphysis. So this is again, often a longer history of a limp. And sometimes there is an acute on chronic component. So we don't want to waste a lot of time talking about Sufis. I'm sure we will do that some other time in the, in the uh, lecture series, but um, a longer history of a limp in an older kid often looks like, oh, when he's walking to school, he's very slow. He's got a little bit of a limp. It's been going on for a long time. He doesn't really say that he's in pain. He's still playing football or she, they're still playing football. They're still playing sports, but slower. They become withdrawn. It's often quite a, a psychological burden, things like that. And sometimes then on top of that, there's a sudden acute, they were playing football and then they're in a lot of pain. That's the classic. So big kid, 14, quite, you know, obese children, um, they were playing a sport and, you know, obese children don't like, they're not sprinting around, they're like just standing there kicking. So they kicked a ball, had a lot of pain and now can't wait there on a history of becoming slow, becoming more obese, becoming bigger because this has gone on for some time. So it's that kind of insidious history. Um, they tend to get an obligate external rotation and that is because and a loss of internal rotation. Now, they get external rotation because the metaphysis, the epiphysis sits, continues to sit in the socket. But the metaphysis and the rest of the leg turns and externally rotates away from the epiphysis. So you get an external rotation of the femur, basically. And that means that when you flex the knee up, you can't flex, you can't, you can't keep the femur in line. It externally rotates. And that's what obligate external rotation means. When you flex the femur up to 90 degrees, you get an external rotation that you can't avoid. It's obligate. So, and they're ob usually large or they've got hormonal problems, including thyroid, or it's a combination of all of those things. Now, sometimes it's nice and obvious like this. And you can see on this X-ray that it's kind of turned outwards. You see how prominent the GT, the greater trochanter here is compared to here. So you can see there's an element of rotation and that rotation is external rotation. And that's why they get that external rotation. These kids will just be lying 
with a little bit of external rotation of their hip. So the next question is this. Let's look at Sufis a tiny bit more. So is this a Sufi? Oh, there's my poll, pops up right in the middle. So uh, is this a Sufi? Yes, Trithawan's sign is positive. No, Clyde's line is totally fine, or I don't know. So let's have a few minutes, have a look at the x-ray. What are we thinking? Do we have the answer? This is a pretty quick question. Let's have the answers. Here we go. One yeah. uh, I don't know is the correct answer. <laughs> I don't know is the correct answer because you have to have a lateral. You really need to, if you suspect a Sufi uh, and you don't see anything on the AP, you can use Klein's line, which is the line that goes, let's see if I can do this. Oh, I cannot do this, hang on. So Klein's line is the li a line that follows the top of the, um, the superior aspect of the neck of the femur and intersects the epiphysis, okay? And then you show it on this side as well, okay? It intersects the epiphysis. Um, it's supposed to pick up quite subtle Sufis, but sometimes you can have an even more subtle Sufi. So, and if that is, if that's positive, so if it doesn't go through there, that's called Trithawan's sign. So Klein's line, Trithawan's sign. But on a, a frog lateral, it's even more sensitive picking up very, very subtle Sufis. And you can't do Klein's line on a frog lateral because if you look at the normal side, if you draw that line, it always misses the uh, epiphysis. So the, the point of the good thing about Klein's line is it makes you look in the right place uh, rather than you having to draw it and relying on it every time. So if you look in the right place here, and here you will spot a difference between two sides and you might spot an abnormality. And if you look where you would draw Klein's line here and here, here and here, then you will spot the difference and you will see the abnormality. So that's the, I think that's the good thing about Klein's line. The actual line, I don't think it's a very sensitive, uh, sensitive tell of whether someone has a Sufi or not. Um, your clinical supervision is there. Your clinical suspicion is the most important thing. Okay, good. So let's move on. This is supposed to be uh, showing you what obligate external rotation is, just in case I didn't explain that very well. So on the right hand side here, you see that's normal. When you take the kid into flexion, the patella is pointed straight up in the air. And on the right side, the slipped side, when you take that kid into flexion, this person is not externally rotating for fun, just to check. You can't keep it in line. The whole femur externally rotates because of the position of the uh, epiphysis and the metaphysis in the acetabulum. Okay, so now this is more into tiger country. This is what you want septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. Right. So, when is it not transient synovitis? That's the difficult thing here. When are you happy that it's transient synovitis and you send them away and you safety net them, you bring them back to fracture clinic in five to seven days and you've done the right thing. And when have you sent away a septic arthritis or an osteomyelitis by mistake? So as we said before, transient synovitis is one or less Cocker's criteria always. Two or more Cocker's criteria, and then throw in a CRP of over 20, you can't call that transient synovitis. You have to try pretty hard to prove that that's not septic arthritis. So if there's a prolonged history of over five days, I would not settle for transient synovitis. I would be trying to prove that it's not septic arthritis. So if, it's, if these two criteria are met, I would get an ultrasound scan to look for an effusion. There's no harm in doing that. You haven't lost anything by doing that. Um, and then wash out, if you have an effusion, is a clinical decision. Unless obviously there is periosteal reaction on ultrasound, which you can see, there's loculation of the collection, um, there's a florid synovitis, you can see all of those things on an ultrasound scan. And those kids need an MRI fairly urgently. And then some things come down to just your experience of these things. So it's worth talking to senior people all the time about these things. So um, 
septic arthritis is often just more septic than osteomyelitis. They're more sick, they're more suddenly unwell. Um, they might be tachycardic, they might have a temperature on and off, a uh, higher temperature than with osteomyelitis, and they may have a more limited range of movement and a kind of short and sharp history. Osteomyelitis, uh, conversely, might also present with limb swelling, just heat around the limbs, erythema, and not a particularly unwell child if it's been going on for some time. So these things come with a little bit of um, experience, which I know is not very helpful for you, but it just means that you need to keep talking to people about the things that you're seeing and about the things that they're seeing and why they're making the decisions that they are making, because then you will build up that bank of experience as well. So where does osteomyelitis, so let's just get into a little bit of the basic science of osteomyelitis just to finish off with. So where does osteomyelitis originate most often in children? Is it in the diaphysis, the epiphysis, the metaphysis or the physis? And I know from Anna's first question that you all know where all of these things are. So where do you most often see uh, osteomyelitis in the bone of children? Okay. Should we have the answer? How are you doing? Metaphysis is correct. 50% of you put metaphysis. I, I'd, that's okay, because obviously this is most often. You can get osteomyelitis anywhere, it can travel anywhere, but it most often starts in the metaphysis. So next question. Oh, where's my thing? Which joints are most likely to develop septic arthritis secondary to osteomyelitis? So these are your options, knee and hip, hip, shoulder, elbow and, am, and ankle, wrist, elbow, shoulder, hip and knee, or shoulder, elbow, hip and knee. Which combination of these joints are you most likely to develop a secondary septic arthritis when you already have osteomyelitis? So we're gonna, we're gonna discuss why the answer to these two questions are the answers in a second. So I will, you will know by the end of this. What's the answer here? Well, that's interesting. Uh, so 59% said knee and hip, which is the wrong answer. Uh, hip, shoulder, elbow, and ankle is the correct answer. And only 12% of you said that. What I will say is knee is wrong. And let's find out why now. So, ah. Uh, Finally, a question that has stumped you guys. So this is why. Uh, so if we draw our epiphysis and the metaphysis here, um, we can see that this question of where the uh, osteomyelitis in children is most likely to commence to start is to do with the blood supply. So you have epiphyseal blood supply, you have metaphyseal blood supply. The metaphyseal blood supply is drawn in like this because there are these hairpin turns and sharp corners to the metaphyseal blood supply. So when your bugs come along, because most, uh, most uh, osteomyelitis in children is spread through the blood, hematogenous spread, they kind of get stasis around those turns, they leach out into the metaphysis, and that's where you get your osteomyelitis. It creeps towards the periosteum, it overtakes the periosteum and gets underneath it and lifts it up off of the bone. And that's when you get your subperiosteal collection, but also you get your kind of onion skinning of your periosteum trying to wall in that infection. So you get a big subperiosteal collection and your periosteal reaction that you can even see on x-rays. That's what you can see in ultrasound. It is very, very obvious once you know what you're looking for. Eventually that purulence breaks through the periosteum and goes into the soft tissues and sometimes even into the, uh, into the air, through the skin, through a sinus. Now, if the metaphysis is inside the joint capsule, then as soon as you get that breakout from the periosteum, you're within the joint capsule. So this is my synovial fluid, synovial fluid hitting, as soon as your purulence hits synovial fluid, it just goes all over the joint capsule. So all inside the joint capsule. So the answer to the second question is, 
joints that have an intracapsular metaphysis are the hip, the shoulder, oh, shoulder, the elbow, and the ankle. So those joints have intracapsular metaphysis, um, intracapsular metaphysis. And so those are the ones that are most likely to go from osteomyelitis to septic arthritis. Okay, and the knee is not one. So the knee does not have an intra-articular or intracapsular metaphysis. That's why knee is not the answer. That's quite a favorite uh, MRCS question, but I think that no one ever entirely knows the reason. That's the reason. So as promised, how to present this like a trauma god so that when you're in the trauma meeting you give everyone you give your audience all of the details that they need to make a, a decision and actually you've already made the decision and you're just telling them what your decision is so this is a template that I would suggest that you use for this so start off with the age and the number of days that the child has had the limp whether there's been any preceding trauma and you can present that in a kind of well the parents said that they fell over but I'm not sure whether that's a, a red herring or whether that's actually part of the uh, pathology here that's that will be very impressive is there a history of a carousal illness or viral illness have they had antibiotics or not because antibiotics can cloud the picture is there any underlying condition are they fully immunized normal birth history developmental history then you say on observation the child holds the leg flexed abducted and externally rotated if they are if they don't you say the child holds the leg in a neutral position and that's very telling you've made your decision about whether you think it's transient synovitis or whether you're worried about septic arthritis by just saying that the child holds the leg flexed abducted and externally rotated they cannot wait bear at all or they can wait bear a little bit with encouragement those two things mean that you've made a decision as well what were the range of move what was the range of movement were they pyrexial when were they pyrexial at home or in the department what was their temperature and how long were they pyrexial for? What was their CRP, ESR, white cells? And then you say, I think this is suspicious for septic arthritis. So I've booked an ultrasound or this has been going on for a really long time. The, the history is unclear. You know, the child has been in pain for some time. I'm worried about osteomyelitis. So I think we should do an MRI. And that's what you need to do. One final thing, if it doesn't fit, don't make it. So medicine is about pattern recognition. If you don't recognize the pattern, it doesn't mean that there isn't a pattern there. It might be something that you haven't thought of. And you have to think about trauma, obviously. You have to think about tumors. And when I say tumors, I mean bone tumors. Oh, pardon me. I mean bone tumors, but also things like lymphoma, leukemia that present in really insidious, horrible ways. You have to think about uh, sickle cell. You can think about rheumatological causes. So if it doesn't fit into septic arthritis, uh, transient synovitis, osteomyelitis, Sufi, Perthes, don't make it fit. It could be something else. So present the findings as you find them. That's it. Thank you very much, Anushka. That was a brilliant talk. And, uh, <laughs> She's like laughing. <laughs> no, 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 it was fantastic. I just loved the... Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to put our feedback form. And so um, everyone that's come joined us today, please do fill out the feedback form. And thank you very much to Miss Bridgens and uh, Miss Aya. It was a, both a fantastic talk. So thank you very much. And we'll see you guys next week uh, for research, which will be by... Professor Xavier Griffin. So uh, thank you very much. Bye. Thank <laughs> you. Oh, one second. Let me just get this sorted. One sec.